Order, and it's time for questions to the Office of the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister, and we'll start with listed questions, and I call Mr Stephen Agnew. Mr Agnew. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Question number one. The Executive's draft 10-year strategy for affordable and integrated childcare is open for public consultation until the 13th of November. The draft strategy proposes 22 interventions or areas of development, including the creation of up to 44,000 new childcare places to meet need, to give effect to the Executive's vision for childcare that every child, parent and family will have access to affordable, integrated, quality childcare. Preliminary work has been carried out on costing the proposed interventions in the draft childcare strategy. Indicative costs are based on estimates for revenue and capital grants to support new childcare places and the projected cost of grant administration and registration and inspection of new childcare places. Of the 22 proposed action, the current school aged childcare grant scheme, expanded to include preschool childcare, is the most ambitious. It aims to create nearly half of the 44,000 places. The grant scheme will also be the most costly of the 22 actions. A key aspect of the evaluation of the current school aged childcare grant scheme will be to estimate the cost of any future interventions and thereby their feasibility in the current economic uh, climate. Other actions that will carry a cost are community based childcare, cross border childcare, assistance for private sector providers childcare for private firms, capital fund for childcare, flexible childcare and childcare for low-income families. These costs will be offset by a range of social and economic benefits, which will be considered more fully in the development of the individual business cases and economic appraisals for each separate intervention. Sustainability is a core objective of the draft childcare strategy. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Mr. Agnew for a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Acting First Minister for her, her answer. Um, it's very welcome that this childcare strategy proposals have, have been brought forward, but many will feel that without the finance to back it up, they'll be uh, worthy targets, um, but without actions to, to go along with them. Is, is the Acting First Minister uh, confident that the finance will be made available to, to fund the strategy? Well, I think that's uh, very important that that does happen. The costings uh, contained in the consultation document are based, as I've said, on modelling uh, that was used for the school aged childcare grant scheme. Um, and of course, we should remember that the whole idea behind uh, these childcare interventions is that they will be sustainable in the longer term. So, whilst there may be an initial injection uh, of money from the executive, the, the idea is that in the future uh, that those um, childcare providers will become sustainable, either through a social economy model or indeed through uh, private models as well. Uh, the idea being that there will be an injection for a while, but what we don't want to do is to get to a situation where we're having to pay out a grant every year, year on year, and actually we. We drag down the market for childcare, which would be the wrong way to uh, move forward. So we need to look at how we're putting the intervention in place and making sure that we get the best value for money out of it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Acting First Minister for her answers so far. She will be aware, I'm sure, that already uh, there has been some criticism from within the childcare sector, uh, particularly around the issue of regulation, which at times does appear to be quite confusing. Uh, I wonder, does the Acting First Minister intend to take a look at this, and is there any actions that she feels that can be taken to address it? Well, as the member will be aware, um, regulating and uh, indeed registering and inspecting childcare facilities is the responsibility of uh, the Department of Health, uh, which is represented on the Child Care Strategy Programme uh, Board. But he's right to point out that there have been um, some uh, complaints that have come forward in respect of uh, the relatively new uh, minimum standards and associated regulation in and around uh, those. And indeed, I had. Uh, a number of uh, private nurseries in my own constituency come to me around some of the ways in which um, those regulations had been put in place and were being implemented. So I think that there is more work to be done, certainly between OFM, DFM and the Department of Health. Uh, and I'm glad to say that that work continues and uh, we want 
with the final uh, issue of the childcare strategy to be able to make sure that the Department of Health is on the same page, if you like, and I know that's a phrase that's been used often recently, uh, but that the Department of Health and OFMDFM are on the same page when it comes to regulation so that it is fit for purpose. Uh, uh, can I ask the Minister, given that one of the aims of the child care strategy is to promote the development of children within their own right, how will children of unemployed parents be catered for within the strategy? Well, already uh, I'm sure she's aware that uh, in the early years um, process, uh, people who are disadvantaged in one way or another are given priority in respect of um, uh, movement into the early years sector, and I'm sure that that uh, is a policy that will continue into the future. Uh, there's a need for us to address ch children of all um, different stratas and to make sure that not only in early years but at school age that they are able to have that childcare provided to them in an affordable way. And I think that that is important because uh, you will recall that OFMDFM had to step in because there was a literally a standoff between the Department of Health and the Department of Education in relation to who had primary responsibility in respect of childcare, and that's why the strategy now sits with OFMDFM. I thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Acting First Minister for her response. Um, given that the Employers for Child Cares uh, survey last year indicated that a full-time place uh, for a child has risen to £162 a week, um, when does the Minister anticipate hard-working families uh, will, being able to benefit from the child care strategy? And I think that's right. We don't want to uh, put people out of work uh, because of childcare costs. We want to be able to facilitate them uh, to go into work. That's the whole purpose, as well as, of course, the development of the individual children. We want to be able to uh, free parents up so that they can uh, go into work and, and be active in the area of work. And that's why those twin strategic approaches have been adopted um, in relation to this strategy. So it is about developing the child, but it is also very much about freeing uh, parents up to go to work. Okay. And before we proceed, can I inform members that questions 5, 6, 9 and 12 have been withdrawn? And I call Mr Gregory Campbell. Number two, Mr Speaker. The Shackleton site is one of massive opportunity and we are determined to maximise the benefits it can deliver, not just to Ballykelly, uh, but for the wider North West. In order to unlock the full potential of the site, we placed approximately 622 acres of it for sale on the open market on 30 June. There has been significant interest in the site and it will remain on the market until 2 October. A key element of the sale is the creation of jobs, and any potential purchaser will need to demonstrate how their plans will create employment opportunities and deliver community and environmental benefits. Northern Ireland Water has confirmed that it will purchase approximately 85 acres of the site to develop an integrated constructed wetlands to replace the wastewater treatment works that currently deals with waste from Ballykelly Village. With Dard's relocation plans also well underway, it really is an exciting time for Ballycally and the North West. I call Mr Campbell for a supplementary. I thank the Acting First Minister for her response, and I'm glad to, to hear that the imminent date of the 2nd of October uh, is just around the corner. When, when the Office of First Minister and Deputy First Minister are looking at the development of the site, will they ensure that it is compatible with the surrounding area, that it maximises the potential for economic growth and some of the uh, projects that are uh, being projected there and being envisaged for there do reach the full potential of the entire North West to bring hundreds if not several thousands of jobs to the area? Well, the uh, Office of First Minister, Deputy First Minister, very much believe that uh, the sale uh, of what is a huge area of land uh, up in the northwest will act very much as a catalyst uh, in terms of economic development uh, in that region. And that's one um, of the reasons why, in terms of how they will decide upon who should be the purchaser uh, of the site, um, they have placed weightings in relation to different elements. And so, for example, in terms of job creation, it has a weighting of 45%. 
uh, in terms of whether the purchaser uh, should be identified as the correct purchaser. Uh, obviously, they look at the financial offer as well, but then again, they're also looking at community benefit and environment, environmental benefit uh, to the particular area. So those four elements will be looked at very carefully. Um, I can tell uh, the House, Mr. Speaker, that we've had over 70 expressions of interest in the site so there's a lot of interest in the site obviously those may not all come forward as bids but certainly that does say to me that there's a lot of interest deputy speaker thank the minister for for her answer and indeed welcome the fact that we have got a good news story coming out of the assembly today i fully support the minister and indeed sing from the same hymn sheet as Mr Campbell on, on this issue. Uh, the Minister uh, did say that she was certainly uh, looking at the community input. And can the Minister tell us how she intends to keep the, the wider community involved and indeed those 70 expressions of interest so that the 900 acre site originally is absolutely maximised as Mr. Campbell says, not just for Valley Kelly, but indeed for the entire North West. And I think the aim is certainly to maximise uh, the potential of the site. That's certainly what has been talked about uh, by officials in OFM, DFM, and by uh, the ministers. Um, officials have had a number of meetings, as I'm, I'm sure the members are aware, with Valley Kelly Community Association uh, to discuss various community uh, benefits from future use of the site. I suppose, in, in, in actual fact, it will be interesting to see the different proposals in respect of community benefit that come forward from those people who actually put forward a purchase price. And we may see some new and innovative ideas, actually, uh, for the benefit of the community. So absolutely, this is a good news story. And we look forward to the 2nd of October, uh, when the bids will come in. And I call Ms Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for her response. Um, it really is a great thing that there's some positive news coming from Bally Kelly, and it just goes to show this Assembly can do things when we want to. Um, have any of the interested stakeholders expressed any concern about the current political situation in terms of their interest in the site? Well, no, I haven't. Uh, I'm not aware of anyone raising any particular issues in relation uh, to the site. Obviously, overall, uh, this House is very much aware of the fact that uh, when we have stability here in Northern Ireland, it is, uh, is of course, uh, a great enabler to people looking at Northern Ireland for investment. However, I think this House should be very pleased to hear that over 70 uh, expressions of interest have come forward in respect of Bally Kelly, uh, and we look forward to seeing what those come out as. Good and call Mr. Declan McAleer. Uh, will the Minister be able to elaborate on where the, uh, the DART headquarters and the NA Water Development are at? Well, obviously, uh, in respect of the DART headquarters, that's probably more of an issue uh, for the Minister for Agriculture. Um, but uh, the relocation of staff, I understand, uh, is expected to be phased with approximately 350 staff taking up position in 2017 and uh, up to 350 more expected to relocate after phase two of the construction when it is completed in 2020. That's in respect uh, of the DARD headquarters. Uh, in respect of the Northern Ireland water um, situation, OFM DFM intends to sell approximately 85.8 acres uh, of the site to NI Water and that's to develop and I think it's a very innovative way of using land, which otherwise may not have been used, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, they're going to use that um, to develop an integrated constructed wetlands, and that's going to replace uh, the wastewater treatment works um, that's been dealing with Bally Kelly Village for some time. So a very innovative way uh, to move forward, as I say, with land, which otherwise may not be used. Thank you. And I call Mrs. Brenda Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question three, please. We remain committed to ensuring that victims and survivors receive the best services possible. In this financial year, over £14 million has been allocated to victim services, with an opening budget for the Victims and Survivors Service of £13.245 million. Following on from the independent review of VSS in 2014, uh, our department, in collaboration with the Commission for Victims and Survivors and the VSS themselves, are continuing to improve services to victims. 
the recruitment of a new Victims Commissioner and additional members to the VSS Board aims to ensure that going forward the needs and interests of all victims and survivors are both promoted and safeguarded. In addition, a collaborative design programme has been set up to develop an improved model for service delivery, which better meets the needs of all victims and survivors. This programme has already made progress, such as, approve, as improved monitoring and evaluation for groups and greater flexibility for individuals. Extensive engagement with a range of groups, as well as individual victims and survivors, has provided positive feedback, which will provide a useful steer to build on the improvements to services which have occurred in recent months. A VSS-led pilot in the use of personalised budgets, caseworkers and the assessment process commenced in July 2015. This approach will identify if changes can be made to current service delivery systems to improve the outcome for victims and survivors in receipt of services through the VSS programmes. Key strands of work are also being taken forward under the Stormont House Agreement in relation to advocacy, a pension and the establishment of a mental trauma service. And I call Ms. Hale for a supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Acting First Minister for her answers so far. And she will be aware that there have been recent reports that perpetrators will be given an amnesty under the new arrangements of the Stormont House Agreement. Can the Minister confirm this is absolutely not the case and never will be? Uh, I'm glad the member has brought that up because there has been a lot of confusing uh, reports in the media uh, recently in relation uh, to amnesty. Of course, there is no proposal for any amnesty uh, in, for those who come forward uh, to the truth recovery mechanism under the Stormont House Agreement. That's very clear uh, in the Stormont House Agreement. Uh, there's no agreement to that. Um, there's no amnesty suggested or discussed by party leaders at the Stormont House Implementation Group. Uh, and there's no intention to include it in any legislation which will be progressed uh, at Westminster. And the reporting, I have to say, of this matter, um, which is wholly untrue, has been very upsetting, uh, Mr. Speaker, to a wide range of people who have suffered uh, during the Troubles. And um, I, I really do think it's very irresponsible to do so. Um, and it has caused a lot of distress. We've seen it in the media, reported. Uh, and I do think that those have report, who have reported it in that way uh, should look at what they're doing to victims and survivors. I call Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the Acting First Minister for her helpful clarification around uh, the issue of amnesty uh, on behalf of parties. Um, and can I ask the Acting First Minister uh, to update the Assembly with regards to progress that is being made around uh, additional advocacy assistance for victims and survivors and helping them to navigate the various avenues of assistance that's available to them? Yes, the Stormont House Agreement stated that, uh, quote, while limited services are in place to provide basic support, there is an urgent need to work collaboratively with victims and survivors and service providers to determine the characteristics of advocacy services, provision and associated costs. So that is very much something that was uh, agreed by all of the parties uh, in Stormont House. And a draft paper was presented to the implementation group on the 17th of August. Uh, departmental officials are continuing to research advocacy provision to ensure appropriate and adequate future provision. I believe this is a very uh, important part of the Stormont House Agreement, and it is something that has been lacking, um, particularly for individuals who don't want to join uh, various groups and who therefore have not a voice uh, when they want to come forward. So the advocacy provisions, I think, are very important. I thank the Minister for her comments so far on this matter. Would the Minister agree that it is very important that in the current talks that a meaningful and real effort must be made to address the fears and apprehensions of victims and survivors, particularly those that have suffered unduly, and where we have big examples of atrocities like Lahan Island, Bloody Sunday, and Eskil Nanoma, among others, and people feel that this place and governments need to seriously address their concerns and fears. I thank the member for his uh, question and his commentary, and, and indeed it underlies what I have been saying. There is a duty upon people who report something as fact when it is not fact, um, and it causes a lot of distress 
uh, and, and, and does do a lot of harm and actually causes more pressure uh, on the services available to victims uh, and survivors. Uh, and there's been a lot of confusion around uh, a draft bill that has been uh, produced by uh, Amnesty International along with CAJ and others um, that really outlines a number of these provisions and they have brought together a bill which to all intents and purposes look as if it has been drafted by draftsmen uh, either in Westminster or here, but it is not uh, a government bill. Um, it is certainly not what was agreed in the Stormont House uh, agreement and therefore should be seen as such as a commentary provided by outside bodies. Thank you. And I call Mr Jim Allister. Thank you. How can the Minister talk about an improvement in the lot of victims when one of the parties with the responsibility for victims, in her words, is inextricably linked to an organisation still in the business of victim making? Well, of course, uh, Mr. Allister is talking about an issue which we are talking about at present in the talks, and there is a very real need. Uh, to deal with the death and those who killed Kevin McGuigan and the, the assessment that then came from the Chief Constable in relation to that issue. Uh, I am dealing with that issue. We are dealing with that issue in the talks and the way to solve it is through the talks. It is certainly not going to be solved by standing outside shouting about it. Thank you. And I call Mr Sidney Anderson. Uh, before Mr Speaker. There are three projects at an advanced stage of delivery in the southern zone which will directly benefit for those living in the Upper Ban constituency. These are an employment project called Work It, which will launch later this month, and two capital projects, New Directions and Sustaining the Infrastructure. New Directions, a project to redevelop two community premises in Lurgan and Market Hill, is currently out to tender for a design team. Sustaining the Infrastructure, a project to redevelop or refurbish 14 community facilities across the zone, has a number of design teams in place and work is ongoing to progress the appointment of contractors and the remaining design teams. Both these significant construction projects are being led by Armagh City, Banbridge and Craig Avonborough Council. There are three other projects in the southern zone which have been prioritised by the steering group. Arma Harps, a new two-storey bill to a GAA facility, was approved for funding but costs have risen significantly and work is now ongoing to minimise the increase and impact on affordability. The remaining two projects, the Community Sports Programme, focused on capital works to four pitches, and the Job Smart Employment Programme, are continuing to be considered for funding through the economic appraisal process. Officials are working with promoters to expedite approval where possible and move to letter of offer subject to affordability. Mr Anderson for supplementary. And can I thank the Acting First Minister for her response? And, uh, can the Acting First Minister confirm that everything possible is indeed being done to push and get these projects uh, in upper band towards the completion stage as soon as possible? Bearing in mind the length of time that we, they have been waiting, and also for other projects that are sitting in Upper Ban, uh, waiting to see where they are sitting at this stage. Thank you. Uh, absolutely, and I can appreciate uh, some of the frustration that has been felt by some of the promoters, but this was uh, a very innovative and progressive strategy that was laid out. Um, it has taken some time to get to where we are, and we do appreciate that a number of projects remain to be approved. Uh, that is frustrating for the steering group uh, and the lead part of it. But the appraisal process is a very robust process, uh, Mr Speaker, for the reason that we want to ensure uh, that not only will we get value for money for these projects, but that also that the projects will be sustainable into the future. Uh, there is little point uh, in building uh, structures right around Northern Ireland if they are not going to be sustainable in the longer term. And that is something that we have been looking very closely at through the appraisal process. And whilst it is frustrating, I accept that. Um, I think we want to ensure that in the longer term there will be a legacy from this programme. I call Ms. Joanne Dobson. Can the Acting First Minister explain why £78 million of the £80 million set aside for the Social Investment Fund is unspent? And what is the Minister's message to the groups awaiting funding in limbo in my constituency of Upper Band? 
Uh, by the 11th of September uh, Mr. Speaker, of this year, the Social Investment Fund has approved 39 projects with associated costs of over £53 million, uh -oh. and that's right across all of the nine investment zones. Well, I hear, I hear some commentary that it's unspent. I hope uh, it's not been suggested uh, that we should withdraw uh, those projects. If you want us to proceed in relation to Upper Ban and indeed to other areas, we have to ensure that it is done in a sustainable way and that value for money comes forward. I accept it's frustrating for project promoters, but if we work collaboratively, we will make this happen and there will be a legacy right across Northern Ireland. Yeah. 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 Could I ask the Minister of Football thank her for her answers? But could I ask her that uh, could she add any if there are any potential difficulties in any of the zonal budgets or the progression of any projects? If the DSD, for example, fails to follow through on their previous funding commitments to SIF projects? Well, there, particularly in relation to this uh, zone, the southern zone, there's a, around, there was around a £2 million uh, pressure, um, and I think I've mentioned that in the substantive answer in relation to rising costs of some of the capital uh, projects. Uh, that has now be minimised down to 1.5 million. There'll always be, um, as is the case indeed with budgets and what have you, uh, a carry forward in respect of pressures. Um, but there are pressures, uh, and we're trying to work with the promoters, with the steering groups, to push those pressures down and to deliver what is sustainable on the ground. Thank you. And I call Ms. Paula Bradley. Uh, question seven, please. The Belfast North Social Investment Fund Steering Group prioritised five projects within the zonal allocation following the area planning process. SIF was therefore not subject to applications from organisations, but rather focused on the development and prioritisation of projects to address need. Of the five projects prioritised, two are at an advanced stage. The first, a capital project called Child Care and Family Support, will build two community childcare facilities in Henry Place and Alliance Crescent. Design teams are currently being procured. The second, called Ethical Investment, is a social economy project aimed to help local community groups set up, support and develop market-ready property-based projects. A service delivery organisation has been appointed and delivery has commenced. Of the remaining three projects, one capital and one revenue project has been uh, approved for funding. The capital project called Increasing Community Services Rebuild will build community facilities at St Enda's in Gengormley, Crusaders FC Shore Road, Westland Community Centre, Pips Antrim Road and Arts for All on the Shore Road. Letters of offer are currently being finalised. The revenue project called Employment Fuel Poverty aims to provide placement for NEETS and a training programme focused on installation of measures to reduce fuel poverty. Discussions are currently ongoing to secure a lead partner for the project. The last remaining project, Increasing Community Services, intends to support refurbishment works to four community facilities. It is continuing to be considered for funding through the economic appraisal process, and officials are working with promoters to expedite approval where possible and move to letter of offer subject to affordability. I call Ms. Bradley for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Acting First Minister for her answer? In fact, can I uh, welcome her uh, that there certainly are, do seem to be advancements in North Belfast. Uh, but can I act, ask the Acting First Minister, um, will she give a commitment that the money that was promised by the Executive for the Social Investment Fund will be ring-fenced to bring about that much-needed change um, in our most disadvantaged communities, not least North Belfast? Well, indeed, and I think sometimes when people start talking about processes, they forget the reason uh, why the programme was put in place in the first place. And the whole idea behind the social investment uh, programme was to help those areas of disadvantage and people who had particular needs uh, to give them a hand up uh, and to put infrastructure in place that wasn't uh, present in those particular areas. So we will continue to work uh, with the project promoters to try and deliver uh, those programmes and those capital bills so that it will make a difference to those particular communities. And we think that that is something that will provide a legacy for this programme. And very quickly, I don't think it would be time for a <laughs> 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 
There are five projects prioritised by the steering group in the south eastern zone which will directly benefit those living in the North Down constituency. Of these, a revenue project called Transitions Early Intervention has service delivery organisations appointed and working to begin project delivery across the zone. The four other projects are continuing to be considered for funding through the economic appraisal process. Two revenue projects, one called Employment and Training and one called Youth Intervention, will operate across the zone. The Community Houses project will refurbish eight community houses, six of which are in North Down, and the Community Operated Sports project includes a proposal to develop a 3G pitch at Kilcoole, alongside two others in Downpatrick and Ballyhornan. Officials are working with promoters to expedite approvals where possible and move to letter of offer, subject to affordability. And that ends the period for listed questions. And we now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Mr. Colin Eastwood. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for uh, her answers thus far? And just to continue the theme, can I ask her how much money from the SIF budget has been spent in the FOIL constituency? Well, I don't have those figures in front of me, so I'll have those figures uh, communicated to the member. Eastwood, if you can get it <laughs> supplementary out of that. Thank, thank, thank the Minister. Uh, for that answer, I think. Um, and can I, can I ask her further to that? Um, when will the letter of offer uh, be sent uh, to Derry City or Derry and Strabane Council uh, around the redevelopment of the Brandywell to allow that work to start? Well, again, I'm sure I can make that letter even longer uh, by ensuring that those details are sent to him as well. Thank you. And I call Mr. Fran McKean. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, does the Acting First Minister have any appreciation of how damaging her reference to her ministerial colleagues as Rose and Renegades was? Could you repeat the question? Can you repeat the question? Does the Acting First Minister have any appreciation of how damaging her reference to her ministerial colleagues as Rose and Renegades was? Well, you know, uh, Mr Speaker, when I was a student of history at school, I always thought it was important to look at the original source material uh, to find out what was actually said, rather than to have it analysed and commented upon by other people. And I've noticed uh, that when I said I was the gatekeeper put in place to stop the possibility of decisions being taken in, uh, by rogue ministers or renegade ministers, all of a sudden, uh, the nationalist ministers in the executive immediately identified uh, themselves as such. Now, I don't know how that it comes from possibility to actuality, but there we are. And, uh, you know, I think people should look at exactly what I said, because, of course, uh, there is form in, in this regard, and they need to remember that there isn't a clear record. Mr McCann, for supplement. Sure, it seems strange because of that. That is her view. Uh, she was quite happy to work with the same ministers over the last eight years. Does the member actually listen to what I actually said? I said the possibility in relation to these matters. And, you know, I, I did say there was form in this regard. And, of course, we do recall uh, that the Minister of Agriculture had to be taken to court in relation to cap reform in terms of agriculture. Uh, the Department of Environment, the Minister for the Department of Environment, I can't hear what the member is saying because I'm answering the question. The Minister for the Department of Environment, we're currently waiting a judgment in relation to matters that he didn't bring to the executive, where he felt he could take a decision as well without the consensus of the executive. I am simply pointing out that in an executive which is made up of a coalition, that you are meant to bring decisions to the whole of the executive. And given that uh, our members, our ministers, have uh, resigned from their position, then nationalist ministers remain in place until such times as uh, there is an election. And even if an election was called, they would stay in place until that election was over. And I think that that is important uh, to bear in mind. And that was the reason for saying what I had to say. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the acting First Minister think the fact that there's no Minister for Health, there's no Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Investment, there's no Minister for uh, Department of Social Development, does she believe that this is a disservice to the public, leading to lack of decision making in vital departments? Well, you know, it could have been so different. It could have been much more easier dealt with. And we put forward 
uh, to the Business Committee on the 1st of September a proposal that the Assembly would be adjourned and so that we could get on with business in terms of the talks process. But instead, uh, we were not supported in that respect, at least the Alliance Party supported us, uh, everybody else decided to vote for business as usual in this Assembly. And actually, today, there was meant to be a, a, a round table meeting of the talks at half past one. Because it had to be put off. Do you know why it had to be put off? Because I had to be in this place answering questions on OFM DFM. So already it is having an impact in respect uh, of the intensity of the talks. And I regret that. And I regret the fact that other parties did not agree to an adjournment so that we could focus exclusively on the talks process. For a supplement. Well, I thank the Minister for her answer and thankfully democracy ruled and on four different occasions the Business Committee um, ruled to continue um, business as usual. But I'd be interested to know, are the DUP going to continue with this tactic of nominating and resigning? And will the newly appointed Minister for Regional Development resign or carry out her duties? Well, because... Um majority rule in the Business Committee has decided that business as usual will uh, continue. It is up to this party to take um, action to make sure that we point out it is not business as usual. A man has died. The finger of blame has been pointed at the IRA and therefore action needs to be taken. And we will ensure that action is taken through the talks process. Thank you. And I call Mr. Mike Nesby. Could the uh, Minister update the House on how many strategies uh, are awaiting completion, sign off, and publication by the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister? Well, I would have thought, given that the member is the chair of the OFM DFM committee, that he would have a very clear view in relation to that matter. Mr. Nesbitt, for a supplement. Well, I, I welcome the Acting First Minister's response, which clearly indicates to me she doesn't know the answer. But the, the areas that you are responsible for include racial equality, sexual equality, age discrimination, childcare. Can I put it to the Minister that it is the inability to agree that is the definition of normal politics in OFM, DFM? Well, if the member had have agreed with us in the business committee, we would not even be here discussing business as usual. We would be in the talks dealing with the issues that need to be dealt with. And of course, the twin issues that need to be dealt with are, for the record, the implementation of the Stormont House Agreement and, of course, the ongoing presence of paramilitary activity that has to be dealt with. And I see this as an opportunity, uh, Mr. Speaker, to deal with those issues once and for all and to get paramilitaries off the backs of the people of Northern Ireland once and for all so that we can move forward into a proper democracy. And I look forward to his support in the talks to make sure that that happens. Thank you. Ms. Megan Farron is not in her place, so I call Mr. Cahill O'Hashian. Mr. Concordia, could I ask the Acting uh, Minister how does OFM uh, DFM intend to deliver an anti poverty strategy based on objective need as acquired by the judgment of the judicial review uh, taken by CAJ? Yes, indeed, and the High Court did find in favour of uh, the Committee for the Administration of Justice in a legal challenge against the Executive uh, for failing to uh, adopt a strategy to tackle poverty, social exclusion and patterns of deprivation on the basis of objective need. Um, and uh, We have accepted uh, that judgment by the High Court. Uh, it has been made clear, however, by the High Court that there are uh, many current programmes and interventions dealing with the same issues that the particular section uh, Section 28E of the Northern Ireland Act uh, sought to address. However, um, the uh, section does create a very clear um, duty to have a particular strategy, and um, that view will be taken account of, and uh, the Department takes its statutory obligations very seriously, and officials will be working uh, to make sure that that is dealt with. 
Mr. Hoshin for a supplement. Mr. I I thank the Minister for her answer. But uh, given that the judgment has been accepted, does the Minister expect the prompt delivery or development of a strategy? Uh, the strategy um, well, I, the Department has been focusing on trying to make sure that the actions um, in the Department are delivered upon. Um, I think we've heard a lot about strategies today. Uh, the chair of OMFM-DFM couldn't tell us how many strategies there were in the department. I think that's indicative of the fact that there are quite a few strategies. But what we should be focused upon is dealing with outcomes. And certainly it is my hope uh, that the next programme for government, it's something that uh, I've been working on in the Department of Finance and Personnel, will focus more on actions and outcomes than on strategies because we could have as many strategies as you want but how is that affecting the individual on the street? And I think that's where we should be looking to. Thank you. And I call Mr. Oliver McMullen. Sorry, Oliver McMullen is not in this place, I notice. So I call Mr. Neil Somerville. Mr. Speaker, I would like to ask the Acting First Minister what engagement OFM DFM has had with Her Majesty's Government in relation to securing a compensation for victims of IRA terrorism during the Libyan supplied weaponry? Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, that is a question that was withdrawn uh, by uh, Mrs. Dobson uh, at number five today in terms of orals, but I will answer it. Um, there has been ongoing um, discussions, particularly from our party, in relation to Libya. We want to make sure that there is a just settlement in relation to having compensation paid uh, to the victims of uh, IRA terrorism, particularly in relation to uh, product that has been delivered from Libya over the years. And of course, there are many victims who have suffered at the hands of that sort of product, and therefore we need to push our own government into making sure that compensation is available. Mr. Somerville, for a supplement. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the answer, the Acting First Minister. Um, you'd be aware it was Libya who provided the IRA with the stockpiles of Samtax, and that the threat is still very much live as Samtax was discovered in the police search in West Belfast on Friday. Will the Minister be discussing the failure to secure compensation for victims of IRA violence from the Libyan source weapons from the Westminster Government and particularly the Foreign Office? Yes, we will continue to push the Foreign Office and uh, I welcome the Northern Ireland Select Committee hearing, uh, which has been hearing directly from uh, the victims of IRA terrorism. Uh, most recently, indeed, my good friend Aileen Quinton was able to articulate how it had impacted upon her life and how she wants justice to come in terms of uh, compensation. And that's right and that's proper. And we will certainly do all that we can uh, to support people like Aileen Quinton to get the justice they deserve. Thank you. And I call Mr. Declan Michael Lee. Uh, um, can the Minister uh, explain how OFM DFM will ensure that a collaborative approach is taken across the executive uh, and welcoming refugees? Yes, indeed, and uh, I'm sure everyone in this House has been moved by the plight of the refugees and the terrible, terrible way in which they have been dealt with uh, over this past period of time. Um, we are taking a collaborative approach with uh, the Home Office. The Home Office is taking uh, the lead in relation to this matter and officials are working with the Home Office to ensure that we play our part in relation uh, to the process that was announced by the Prime Minister. And Mr Michael Lear for supplement. Um, I to thank the Acting First Minister for her answer. Uh, does the situation highlight uh, the need for a racial equality strategy to be put in place? Well, the racial equality strategy has finished its public consultation now, a 16-week public consultation. I understand that it's currently with government departments uh, for their commentary in relation to the strategy. Um, once that has been uh, completed, and I understand it's very close to that, then we can move forward to the next stage. Thank you. And I call Ms Maeve McLaughlin. And can I ask the Acting First Minister for an update on progress on the gender equality strategy? Yes, the gender equality strategy again is something that is moving forward. As the member is aware, um, the new strategy is to come into force, we hope, next year. That's when the old strategy uh, runs out. 
uh, the gender equality um, Forgive me, there's a, a the committee that has been set up uh, to deal with these matters have met. Uh, the junior ministers uh, attended a meeting of that strategy committee meeting on the, in June of this year uh, in a listening capacity, and we're certainly pushing ahead with the strategy because, of course, it is something that is needed in Northern Ireland to have that gender strategy in place, and the old strategy will stay in place until the new strategy comes forward. Quick supplementary, then. I uh, thank the Acting First Minister for that. But can the Minister maybe assure me that any new gender equality strategy will take proper account of the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 and also of the gender principles for dealing with the legacy of the past? Well, of course, the UN Convention makes references to what happened here uh, over this past 40 years in a way which we may disagree upon, but certainly the principles that lie behind. Uh, what it is speaking about is something that we will uh, endeavour to deliver. Uh, the strategy, we hope, will be more focused, it will be more integrated. And uh, To quote Hillary Clinton, however, uh, you cannot be what you cannot see, so there is a need to have more women in the public eye and to make sure uh, that we encourage uh, young women, uh, indeed women of all ages, to become involved in public life. Your time is up. And just let me finish the, uh, the, the question time. The next item of business is, is questions to the Minister of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. And as there is a vacancy in that ministerial office, question time cannot proceed. Sorry, who was the point of order while I was speaking? Does somebody make a point of order? Yes, Robin. Mr Speaker, just a point of order, a point of clarification. Uh, in response to Mr Somerville's topical question number eight, the item first minister referred to Mrs Dobson's question number five. Actually, Mrs. Dobson having withdrawn that question. Could I ask the Speaker to investigate through the business office that was actually the business office requested that question be withdrawn on request from the department itself? Well, I'm, I'm informed uh, just by the clerks here that, uh, that, that your point is correct, but uh, if you need that formally, uh, you know, formally validated, then I suggest that, uh, that you call in with the, uh, the business office. That actually was the information I was given as well uh, when we were considering it. Okay, and the... Some clarification as to the capacity of departments to throw back questions which are tabled to the business office because the departments don't like them and say we're not going to answer that. How have we reached the pass where that is even possible when a question patently is within the remit of the department, but it's too embarrassing or too awkward for the department to answer, so they simply tell the business office, we're not answering. What sort of a way is that to do business? Well, there may be issues of detail in, involved in all of this, but uh, while members can ask questions of a minister, uh, they have to be able to kind of be satisfied, and the minister has to be satisfied it's within their remit. Now, there may be issues of detail here that have to be teased out, but um, my understanding is that that, in fact, is the rationale that was applied. Uh, I don't have access, or at least I'm unaware, of the exact composition of the question. So that's an issue that uh, perhaps we'll have to kind of come to a conclusion on subsequently. And the next item on the order paper is the adjournment. The question is that the Assembly do now adjourn. The Assembly is adjourned. <laughs>